So for this bit here, what we're going to be focusing on is again back to our profit equation here. Profit is total revenue minus total cost. What we're going to focus on for the moment is here on this total revenue side. Keep in mind what we said about total revenue is that this is the price that we can sell each unit for times the number of units that we're able to produce and thus be able to sell. What we're going to do is we're going to take one step farther and we're going to take a look inside of this Q, this number of units, this quantity of units that we're able to produce. And what we're going to do is we're going to say that the amount that we're able to produce is going to be some function given our level of technology for our inputs, labor, and capital. So, right, the way that you can imagine this, we have some functional form, doesn't even matter for our sense here what this functional form is, but we have some functional form. Technology has some input into it, but of course it's fixed. We input some labor, we input some capital, and this labor and this capital goes to work, and boom, out pops some quantity. If we're talking about chairs, if we're talking about coffee, out comes some level of output. The way to kind of think of this, right, we would call this our production function. Let's just write that down. Our production function. The way to think about this production function is kind of as such. Let's imagine that we have, I don't know, we have this magic little meat grinder here. So we have the little handle that we turn and up top here we have our little hole that we put our inputs into. So we'd have our labor, we have our capital. Uh, what do we have for capital here? Let's say we have a shop. So let's just kind of draw a factory here. This is gonna be our capital. And so we drop these into our production function inside the production function they go to work and based off of how much labor how much capital i put in here when i put them to work and i spin the wheel well out comes some amount of good and say we're making cups of coffee so there we go boom in goes my labor and capital the production function does its thing. It's kind of like this magic black box in terms of 103. And so we throw these in, they transition this labor, this capital, these raw inputs out into our final good, our cup of coffee. In this case, right, keep in mind, we were talking about our short run. So if we go back to taking a look at this production function, well, technology, this little T attached to the function, of technology well that's fixed that's just some number that might show up okay our capital well again capital is fixed that's just dictated to us we only have one shop we only have one espresso machine one uh, coffee pot right all of this all of this capital is fixed we cannot change this meaning our only choice is our labor this is the only thing that we can choose to add more into our production function, into this black box. And you can imagine, as I add more people, I'm going to get more output. Let's take a look at what that looks like. So let's take a look at this coffee shop. We have all of our capital fixed. In order to be able to produce coffee, we need people, right? We need to add people to this in order to get coffee to be made. The espresso machine isn't just gonna make it itself. The cash register isn't just going to collect money from patrons by itself. So let's take a look at what happens as we go through this process. So let's create just a little table to start off. And for this table, let's take a look at first how many workers we have. So write again L for workers. We're then going to take a look at how much output this worker can make. So Q, the amount of output. So starting off, let's suppose that it's just you. You're the owner, you're the operator, you can produce one cup of coffee. Sorry, no, 
No, you're producing one cup of coffee. You are one person. As one person, you are running the cash register. You are dealing with the espresso machine. You're grabbing baked goods. You're also busting the tables, right? You have all of this that you are doing, everything that you're trying to take care of all at once. Let's suppose, just to put a number to it, that you would be able to produce 20 cups of coffee. Let's say that's per hour. That is how much you could produce and sell with just you. What, could, what we could also look at then is we could take a look at the average, and we'll call this the average product of labor. And what this is going to say, okay, on average, how much output can each person make? So that is, if we were trying to figure it out, this would be output per worker. So if we work this out, 20 divided by 1, we have an average product of labor of 20. So let's say you're like, you're getting tired, you're running around, you're doing everything, you're like, maybe I can actually be better off if I hire a second person. So you hire a second person. Now, maybe you want to make sure all the money is good. So you're running the cash register. Your second person is running the espresso machine and the baked goods. And when things are clear, one of you is going out and bussing tables. So here we hire a second person. And now all of a sudden, we jump up to something like, let's say, uh, 44 cups of coffee that can be sold in an hour. Right? So in this case here, you are just doing the cash register. The other person has their specialized job. We have lots of room to work. And so on average, we are able to produce... 22 cups per person. So, okay, hey, we're getting more output per person because we can specialize a little bit in our duties. So things are looking good. Let's, let's add a third worker. So we add a third worker. Well, okay, things are getting a little bit cramped back here now, right? So there's you on the cash register. There's the other guy there doing the espresso machine and grabbing baked goods. Not a ton of room. So this third person, well, they get to be out here bussing tables, greeting people, doing dishes out in the back, and covering for you and your first employee when you have breaks. So, okay, we have this one here, and we're now going to jump up. Let's say that this brings us to, uh, let's say, 60 cups. So, okay, we are now making 60 cups, but if we work out this output per worker, we'll notice that, oh, we're back down to 20 cups per person, right? The thing that happened here is that we started to have a point of congestion. We only had so much capital, but as we added workers, 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 right? Workers can only be productive if they have this espresso machine to work with, this cash register to work with, this bakery display to work with. They can't just will espressos into being. So as now we've had workers that don't have a piece of capital for them to utilize directly, they have to wait. They have to do other tasks that aren't directly productive while they wait for their turn to use the productive capital. In this sense here, our output still increased, but we notice that our average output has started to fall. So we keep going though, and we're going to add a fourth worker. And our fourth worker, let's say that this jumps us up now to something like 75. Um, actually, let's make this a little bit easier mathematically. Let's say that this jumps us up to 76. So again, our average worker, our average output per worker there, that's going to now be dropping. We now have 19. Add another worker, what's that going to give us? Uh, let's say that this here is going to jump us up to, let's say, uh, where are we going to end up at? 90? So if we end up at 90 cups of coffee an hour now, again, we're going to have our average product. Our average product keeps dropping. 90 divided by 5, we're going to have 18. Okay, so we see big takeaway with this. As we add more and more and more workers, we get increasing output. But what we see is that this increases initially a lot, right? We get a big increase because, hey, there's lots of capital available for us to use. But once we hit that point of congestion, once there's no longer a free piece of capital for the extra worker to utilize, 
well, we begin to have falling average products. What we can also take a look at here is rather than just the average product, we can take a look at this new term. Let me just change color because this guy's going to be rather important. We can take a look at our marginal product of labor. And what this marginal product is, right? Marginal, this is a pretty big word. We've used this margin quite a few times. We've said that the margin is that right on the edge, that incremental change. So in this case, what I'm curious about is, hey, if I add an extra worker, how much extra output do I get? So that is, if we want to think about that mathematically, if I change my workers, so delta L, that little triangle, if you're not familiar with that, let's say delta L, what that means is that's going to be labor two minus labor one. So second minus first worker kind of idea, the change in workers. And similarly then change in Q is the change in output. So that would be Q2 minus Q1. We would get our how much extra output we received for hiring that extra worker. So working this out then, uh, what's our change in output? Well, labor two was two, labor one was one, so we had plus one worker, we added a worker. Change in output though, 20 up to 44, well, that is 44 minus 20, that's gonna be 24. So, okay, as I went from one to two workers, I increased, I added this marginal product of 24. Right, so that extra worker gave me an extra 24 cups of coffee as I went from there to there. What about when I went from two to three workers? What did two to three workers give me? Well, change in workers is one. Change in output in this case, that's going to be 16. Carrying on down, change in workers is again one. In this case here, change again is 16. Is that right? Yeah, 16. And then finally here, four to five is again one. And this is gonna be 14. So we witness that in the margin, every extra worker that I add, I witness this diminishing marginal return. These two were the same. This here works out just to be me making up numbers as I go through we would typically witness what we would re uh, refer to as these diminishing marginal returns. And what that is, is we would expect as we add more and more workers for a fixed level of capital, our output would increase, but it would increase at a decreasing rate that the amount of extra output we get from each extra worker is less and less and less and less. Sometimes it's a bit easier just to kind of see this in a maybe a bit more simpler of a story. And so let's suppose that we have a big piece of land here and we have city workers that need to dig some ditches. Now these city workers, let's suppose that we have these are shovels, not arrows. We have two shovels available to our city workers to dig these ditches with, right? So right, if you want to think about that, that's our capital stock is two. We have two pieces of capital, two shovels. Now, as we add a city worker, right? So here's our first worker. They have a unit of capital right there for them. They can begin to dig holes. We add a second worker. Great, second worker has a shovel available to them. They can also start to dig holes. So two workers, we now have two holes. As we add a third worker, well, this third worker doesn't have a piece of capital, doesn't have a shovel to use. So this third worker doesn't have anything immediately to do. But if you've ever done, gone digging ditches, digging holes, you'll know that it's pretty tiring work what this third worker allows is for this capital to be passed off when one of these first two workers are resting. So now let's say that we get to dig, I don't know, 
trying to do a two thirds of a hole kind of idea, right? We don't get an extra plus one hole, but we're getting eh, two thirds. If I had a fourth worker, well, same kind of story, no shovel for them, but again, they can switch off as people get tired. We already had one switching off, so we're not switching off as much. So now we're maybe down to one third of a hole being dug by this fourth worker and on and on and on, right? Maybe our fifth worker does just like a 10th of a hole, barely anything. And so what we see, same kind of concept as we had above, as we add more workers, we get more output, but our output is increasing at a diminishing rate. That is, we're getting a diminishing marginal return from our laborers. So how exactly does this all work out? Well, we can graph this relationship using what I'm going to call our product curves. And we can take a look at what our product curves show about the average return to labor and the marginal return to labor. Let's take a look at that. So taking a look at our product curves, let's start off. We'll draw our axes here. We'll have, let's go use white for that. We'll use our vertical axes. We have our horizontal axes, and on our vertical, we're going to be taking a look at how much output we can have per worker, and our horizontal is going to be looking at how many extra workers we have. So essentially, hey, as we add more and more and more workers, what happens to the productivity or that output per worker? To start off, let's take a look at our average product of labor. So keep in mind our average product of labor, this is gonna be just strictly that output per worker. What we find is that this average output of worker kind of creeps up, hits a hump maximum, and then drops on down. And we have the output per worker, this average product. Keep in mind, that's the same idea as what we saw up here. As we added workers, we initially saw an increase, and then we began to decrease thereafter. So, okay, it holds up with our story. What we're also gonna take a look at then is that marginal product of labor, and such that our marginal product of labor starts above the average, quickly raises, hits a spike, and then drops down through, oh, that was pretty ugly, let's, let's try that again. Raises up, hits a maximum, and then is gonna drop down through that maximum point of the average product, and then carry on underneath. And that would be our marginal product of labor. Big thing with this, hopefully it kind of worked out and not just an artifact of our uh, freehanding it, but we'll actually intersect this average product right there. That there is right at our maximum average product of labor right and again this isn't just a coincidence from how we drew this this is actually going to be a stable relationship and we'll talk about why this is the case in a second as we carry on so our marginal product of labor spikes quickly and begins to drop we would refer to this spike here right the reason as to why this happens this here is our point of congestion right this is the point where when we added worker 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 but only had so much capital our workers began to get into trouble with each other and it kept being oh i can't do my job because you have the capital i'm just going to have to wait until you take a break or something along these lines so that is once we hit this point we began to witness that our extra output per worker was falling right? We had a falling extra output for every extra worker we hired. What we would say then is that from this point onwards, we would have diminishing marginal returns. And technically, right, if we wanted to get technical, this would be diminishing marginal returns to labor. That is every extra worker we hire gives us less and less output. Similarly, taking this point here, 
at this point, we begin to witness our diminishing average returns such that beyond this point here, every extra worker we hire, we get less and less output per worker on average. And so both curves dropping off beyond that point there. Okay, this is the shape of our curves. One of the big things that we'll see and what I'm gonna actually wanna do is put a big star beside this marginal product of labor because as we'll see in just a second here and then going forward into our next videos, this marginal product of labor curve, this is our driver. This curve determines really the shape of everything else for our producer theory. This whole diminishing marginal returns, this is the fundamental concept that explains so much of everything to follow. And okay, it might be completely lost. It might be like, okay, but Keith, why? Why does marginal product hit average product and then average starts to fall? Why does it have to have these shapes? Well, okay, we have this initial spike and dropping down just based off of that story we started off to, right? You can think of our ditch diggers and the fact that our capital was limited. As we first added our first ditch digger, our second ditch digger, there was two shovels, right? So our output jumped as a result. But as we added our third, fourth, fifth ditch digger, well, we were getting less and less extra output for that extra worker. The average product of labor we'll see is very similarly driven by that. And let's go talk about that specifically. Let's switch our discussion to talking about something we might be a bit more familiar with. Rather than talking about production, amount of output being produced, let's talk about grades. And let's take a look at our average grade versus our marginal grade. And take a look at how the marginal grade drives the average grade. And right, to keep that in mind, what we set up here, the marginal product of labor drives the average product of labor. So let's go take a look. Let's suppose that to start off, we have on our first assignment, right? So we have no assignments done. First assignment, we get 70%. Well, if this is our only grade, well, that's gonna drive our average grade to also be 70%, right? If that's the only thing, the average of one thing is just one and the same. Keeping in mind, your grades are just an average of all the assignments you complete. Then we go and we do another assignment. And on this next assignment, you get 75%. Great, you're doing better, right? You've learned from some of your mistakes. Next assignment, you're doing even better. What's the best part about this though, is this marginal assignment, this extra assignment you've done, well, you did better than your average course grade. So that's gonna push up your course grade. Let's say it pushes us up to 72%. As long as we keep doing better, then our average course grade will keep pushing up the course grade. So we do another assignment. Next assignment, we get a 74% on. Uh, we didn't quite do as well. Maybe material got a bit tougher, but we're still greater than the average, so it's still pulling up our average. So that pulls us up now to say 73%. Let's just bring this back to our diagram and think about this. As long as our extra marginal assignments, right? So the red line, marginal, as long as this was greater, as long as we were doing better on these than our average, the average was being pulled up, right? So we see that here. As long as the red line was above the green line, the green line's being pulled up. Okay, another assignment. On this one, we get 73%. Oh but 73%, that's the same as our course grade. Well, in that case, it's gonna have no influence. It's not gonna pull up our grade, but it's also not gonna push down our grade. It's just gonna keep our grade flat, 73%, right? No impact at all. That's this point right here, where the marginal and the average are one and the same. We're not having any impact. Okay, we keep going on. Let's do one more at least. Next assignment comes back 
and we're now back to getting another 70 on this assignment. Not terrible, but on this extra assignment, we did worse than our course grade. So because we did worse than our course grade, this is gonna pull down our class average, such that, not class average, sorry, our grade average. And so that's gonna pull down our grade average to maybe back to 72. And we see that up here just the same, right? As the marginal is below the average, well, the marginal, this extra assignment, extra assignment, extra assignment, is pulling down your average grade. And so in that sense there, our marginal is the driver of this average. Hopefully that helped to clear it up a bit. This is a notoriously abstract topic to get a grasp over. Won't be a big part going forward. It does underpin our next model that we take a look at. Um, there's a bit of cross-contamination between the two that we will discuss. But the big thing to get in mind is that we have this spike. And then from this point onwards, that is for most of our range, we are experiencing diminishing marginal returns. This is our big key concept, diminishing marginal returns. That as I add more and more workers, every extra worker gives me less and less and less output. My output still goes up, right? We saw that up here. Output keeps climbing but my marginal product is falling. The extra output for an extra worker is getting smaller. And that's, that's the biggest idea of this topic here. If you have any questions on this, feel free. Contact me through the Frequently Asked Questions. Send me an email. Be more than happy to work through it. Next, we're going to go from taking a look at this quantity side, how output is produced in this production function, to taking a look at the cost side of our profit function and bringing it all together eventually to take a look at profitability altogether. But let's go jump over and take a look at costs. So we have our profit equation. We have profit as total revenue minus total cost. We have so far opened up this total revenue side to take a look at price times quantity, right? So, okay, how many cups of coffee do I sell at two bucks each? That gives me all the money, all the revenue that I've earned. We then took this Q and we opened this up and we said, hey, this quantity, this amount of stuff that we're able to make, well, quantity, this is just gonna be some function of labor and capital such that our capital is fixed. So really, if I just change my labor, I change my output. We then took a look at this relationship between labor and output with our product curves. And with that, we took a look at the average product of labor and our marginal product of labor. Where we're going next is we're gonna open up this total cost side of things. And keeping in mind, we are dealing with economic profit. So every time we refer to costs, total costs, these are both explicit and implicit costs. We're not going to make the differentiation between the two anymore. We're not going to say, hey, this is an explicit, this is an implicit. It's just going to be understood that anytime we talk about costs, they are both costs the explicit and the implicit lump together. What we want to do then further with our costs is we want to make it clear that we are dealing with our costs in the short run, right? And again, we're dealing with it in the short run because our capital is fixed. And if our capital is fixed, well, our capital costs are fixed. So that is in our short run, we're going to have our fixed costs from capital. I'll just put the K here to say where it's from. And we're going to have our variable costs. And these variable costs, well, what varies? Labor varies as output varies. So our variable costs will be our labor costs. So in that sense there, what we're going to say is that our total cost 
is going to be equal to our total fixed cost plus our total variable cost, where inside this total fixed cost would be both explicit and implicit costs of capital, and inside this total variable cost would be both explicit and implicit costs of labor. Okay, so this is our total cost function. Total cost is total fixed plus total variable. But what we're going to take a look at is just very similarly to how we took a look at average product and marginal product, we're going to take a look at average costs and marginal costs. And let's, let's do that. Just scroll down a bit. And we're going to have our starting off, let's start with our average costs. We'll start off with our average fixed cost. AFC for average fixed cost. And average fixed cost is just going to be that total fixed cost divided by our output. So fixed cost per unit is essentially what that guy is going to work out to. We're also going to have our average variable cost, which is going to be very much the same way, total variable cost per unit. So, okay, this is essentially our labor cost per unit. And then, well, just like we have our total fixed, total variable giving us total, well, we will have our average total cost, which is just going to be our total cost per unit, which we could also work out as our average fixed plus our average variable cost. So three different average costs from our three different total costs. Our final one to take a look at, no, oh, let's just erase that little mark I made there. Our final one to take a look at would be our marginal costs, right? We had our averages, let's also take a look at our marginals. Our marginal cost, again, marginal is a change in for a change in something else. So we're gonna take a look at what is the change in our cost in order to produce another unit. So our marginal cost is gonna be the change in our total cost for a change in output. The way to read this, if I were to produce plus one cup of coffee, how much does my costs increase by? An extra cup increases my costs by how many dollars? And I can work through it that way there. Let's take a look at really these average variable costs and this idea as to why we only have a marginal cost. That is, hey, why don't we have also a marginal fixed cost and a marginal variable cost? Why don't these guys exist? Well, let's start off with this whole marginal fixed cost bit. Marginal fixed cost, so with marginal what we're measuring, this would be what is the change in our total fixed cost for a change in units, right, units produced. Well, hey, wait a minute. If we think about this, our total fixed cost, these are fixed. This is the cost we paid for our tools, for our machinery, for our factory, all of that. And we had to pay this cost if we produced one unit, zero units, a thousand units. So that is, this is not changing as output changes. So if we went and did total fixed cost two minus total fixed cost one all over Q2 minus Q1, well, Total fixed cost two and total fixed cost one would be the same. It's a fixed cost. It would be say a million dollars for all of the money we had to spend for all of our equipment. A million minus a million would be zero over whatever our change in output was. So zero divided by any number, well, that's just gonna give us zero. So we're always gonna have a total fixed cost of zero. Sorry, not a total fixed cost, a marginal fixed cost of zero, hence why we don't really utilize it. What about this marginal variable cost? 
couldn't we do that? Well, technically, yeah, we could do that marginal variable cost. And in fact, this marginal variable cost is technically what our marginal cost is even looking at. And let's take a look at why that's the case. Let's write down this marginal cost formula. Marginal cost is the change in total cost over the change in output. Okay, total cost. Well, we said total cost was just total fixed plus total variable. So let's update that. So change in total cost, that's going to be total cost 2 minus total cost 1, Q2 minus Q1. If we open up these total costs, that's going to be total fixed cost 2 plus total variable cost 2 minus total fixed cost 1 plus total variable cost 1. All over, oh, I'm running out of room here. Let's, uh, there we go. All over Q2 minus Q1. What happens as we go through this, right? This change in total cost? Well, here's total fixed cost two, here's total fixed cost one. Hey, total fixed cost minus total fixed cost. That's what we just did up here. We said that those two were gonna cancel each other out and leave us with zero. That means if we update this, right, if we just carry this down to the next line, marginal cost is actually just gonna be total variable cost two minus total variable cost one all over Q2 minus Q1. That is the change in total variable cost all over the change in Q. That is what we've just gone and shown is that this marginal cost change in total cost for a change in output is actually identical to what we would have for just change in total variable cost for change in output. So again, to go back to this question, why don't we have three different marginal costs? We can't have a marginal fixed cost because it's fixed. There is no change in fixed costs. And then we only have this marginal cost because, well, really this is the same as what our marginal variable cost would work out to be. So the same in this case here. Okay, so that's that bit there. We'll come back to this in a second. Let's take a look at one more bit here. Let's go and take a look at our variable costs. We said that our total variable cost is our total variable cost is our labor cost. And what we can do is we can just simplify this quite easily to say, okay, total variable cost, this is going to be my wage rate, how much I pay my workers, times how many workers I have. So if that's the case, my average variable cost could be simplified to be wage rate times my workers over my output. Hey, hopefully this bit here kind of looks a little bit familiar. Output, sorry, output L is workers. So right now we're looking at workers per unit produced. If we keep in mind, in this last bit we just looked at with our product curves, we were taking a look at the average product of labor, which was saying, hey, how much output could a worker make? Output per worker. So in this sense here, what we should see is that the average variable cost and the average product of labor are just the inverse of one another, where the average variable cost is scaled up by the wage rate. So these two curves are going to be implicitly linked together, or I guess in this case, explicitly linked together. You use the right words. Okay, taking that same idea down here then, we can take a look at this marginal cost and we can do much the same idea. We can say, hey, hey, change in total variable cost. Well, that is change in wage times workers all over 
change in output. Now, if we make an assumption that the wage rate's constant, we pay our first worker 10 bucks an hour, we pay our second worker 10 bucks an hour, that is, wages are not changing with our workers, wages are not changing with our output, well then, there is no change in W. So we could simplify that, let's just go down to the next line. We could say that marginal cost is equal to the wage rate times the change in workers over the change in output. Okay, why is, why is that important? Well, in this case, this is gonna be linked to, if we recall back, our marginal product of labor was saying, hey, what is our change in output for adding an additional worker? So, right, we see again, this bit here is just the inverse of our marginal product of labor scaled by the wage rate. So again, we have this explicit link between our marginal product of labor and our marginal cost. Keep in mind, when we were talking about our product curves, we said that this marginal product of labor was driving the entire product curves. Very similarly then, this marginal product of labor is gonna drive our marginal cost, which will in turn drive all of our cost curves. Okay, that was a lot of algebra, right? If math's not your strong suit, if you're looking at this and you're like, oh man, I'm in a 100, cor 100 level course, what is going on with all of this? Don't get too caught up on it. I'm never going to say, hey, show that the marginal cost is the same as what we could call a marginal. Ver no, I'm not going to have you do any of that. The big reason why we went through all of these steps was just to show this end result, that these two are related. Similarly, the whole reason we went through this was just to show this result here that these two are related. So what's the takeaway? That last point. These two are related. These two are related. So big takeaway there. That's really what we're hoping to get out of this. Let's take a look then at how exactly this all works out, how we can graph these and what the relationships are between the curves. Okay, so in order to take a look at the relationship between our curves, first thing to notice is that we're actually dealing in the average and the marginal costs, not our total costs, right? And again, this all comes back to our basic fundamental assumption about firm behavior, that firms exist to maximize profit, and they do so in the margin. So this marginal cost and these average costs are really the big important part that we want to take a look at. So these curves have a specific shape that is relatively constant as we move through the rest of this course. And so what we're going to take a look at here is how to draw these curves and how to maintain the relationship between them. So in order to draw these curves, we're going to start off, my recommendation is to start off with the average fixed cost. And the reason why I recommend to start off with the average fixed cost is that it's just, it more or less does its thing. Let's say we had a million dollars for our cost for all of our capital, right? Total fixed cost was a million dollars. As we produce more and more stuff, well, this average fixed cost just drops, right? Initially, produce one unit, our average fixed cost is a million dollars. We produce two units, well, now it's 500,000. Three units, 333,000. Four units, 250,000, right? On and on and on. Each time we're just doing a million divided by one, a million divided by two, a million divided by three, on and on. So that is our average fixed cost. It's going to start at some point, maybe that was our million, and it's just going to drop off in a fashion like that. Technically, it will never actually touch this horizontal axis, it will just get closer, 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 closer but won't ever actually touch. Okay, that there being the average fixed cost, moving on, the next one we would like to take a look at is the average variable cost. And the average variable cost, we would say that this is a U-shaped cost curve. That is, the average variable cost initially dips down, hits a minimum, and then from this minimum, it is going to begin to rise up like so. So we'll mark that average variable cost. 
And why does it have this shape here? Well, we'll talk about that in a second, but the big reason, right, if you can just kind of recall from it, this average variable cost is the inverse of our average product of labor. And so if you go back and think about the shape of that average product of labor curve, it begins to make sense as to why we have this shape for our average variable curve. Again, we'll explicitly look at that in a few minutes. Next one then, let's take a look at our average total cost curve. Keeping in mind average total cost is total cost per unit or average variable plus average fixed. That is for every measure of Q along the bottom here, our average total cost would be this average fixed value, right? Average fixed value plus the average variable value giving us our average total value. So we notice, okay, average variable dips and then begins to climb, but average fixed is continually falling. So what happens is that initially this average total has a good gap between average variable and average total. This vertical distance between the two lines, well, that's this value right here, our average fixed. As we increase our output though, and average fixed cost falls, the vertical distance between these two lines will begin to decrease as well. So average total is similarly gonna be U-shaped. It's gonna drop down. It's gonna hit a minimum to the right of our average variable cost curve. And then from that minimum point, it will rise up. It will get close to the average variable, but it won't ever touch it or cross it. It'll always sit above that average variable cost curve, as we've shown here. Finally, last curve to take a look at is our marginal cost curve. We said that really this guy's the true driver of the rest of these cost curves, just like how the marginal product of labor was the driver of our average product curves. And let's take a look at that. This guy initially takes a dip, hits a minimum, and then rises up. It rises up right through the minimum average variable cost. Keeps going up. Oh, that was not where I wanted to go. Keeps rising up right through the minimum of our average total cost curve, and then continues from there in an upward fashion. And we have this initial dip and then rising marginal costs. This gives us our cost diagram. What we'll often see this drawn as is just like we have it, but without this average fixed cost curve drawn in. We'll often omit this curve from our diagram. And the reason why you'll often see it with that curve omitted is A, it just makes the diagram less cluttered, and B, we can always infer what the average fixed cost is is that vertical distance between average total and average variable, right? Because average total is average fixed plus average variable. So for any quantity, that vertical distance is our average fixed cost. So we will often see this with the average fixed cost curve omitted. Okay, taking a look at this, some big kind of points of reference to kind of keep in mind with this. First one, let's take a look right here, this minimum point on our marginal cost curve. This minimum point on our marginal cost curve, we would refer to this as our point of congestion. Right, and you're like, hey, didn't we have another point of congestion? Yeah, yeah, we did actually. And we'll come back and talk about that. But this point of congestion, this is the point where, as we added more and more workers, we no longer had free capital for them to utilize. So beyond that point, we had diminishing marginal returns. So from that point onwards, we have diminishing marginal returns. Diminishing marginal returns, just like in our product curves. And then, just like in our product curves, we can take this point where the marginal cost crosses the average variable cost. We can draw this point down and we can refer to this as from that point onward, 
we're going to have our diminishing average returns. And then one last point of reference on these cost curves here. This one right here, our minimum point on our average total cost curve. Keep in mind this minimum point on our average total cost curve where average total cost crosses average variable cost. This point here will give it a special name. We'll call this the capacity of the firm. We are saying that at this level of output, right there, we sometimes, all sometimes call this point here QC for quantity at capacity. This is the level of output the firm can produce with the lowest cost per unit, and that is the capacity of the firm. So we have our cost curves drawn. Again, recommendation as to how to draw it. If we're ignoring the fixed cost, start off with the average variable cost as a U. Next, move on to the average total cost. Drop it down as a U with a minimum to the right of the minimum average variable. And with these curves getting closer, but never ever touching as we increase our output. Finally, draw the marginal cost curve, dipping, then rising up through the minimum of each of the others, extending on upwards. Points of interest, minimum marginal cost, minimum average variable cost, minimum average total cost, and we have diminishing marginal, diminishing average, and our point at capacity. What we're gonna take a look at next is the relationship between these cost curves and our product curves that really explain why this curve has the shape it does and how we have these carry forwards between at least these first two points. Our capacity point doesn't really carry back to our product curves. Let's take a look at that next. Okay, let's take a look at this relationship between our product curves and our cost curves. So to do so, let's start off with taking a look at our product curves. So our product curves, in order to graph those guys, let's start off. We have our vertical axes, that's output per worker, and we have our horizontal axes, number of workers. So workers, output per worker, and then similarly over here, we are going to have our cost curves, which are in terms of output and dollars per unit produced. And this was our cost curves. Okay, starting off with our product curves then, we had our average product of labor, which just kind of went up and then came back down as such, and average product of labor. Such that again, average product of labor, that was output per worker. We then had for our product curves, our marginal product of labor that started off above, quickly spiked, dropped down through the maximum point there, and then carried on as such. And that's our marginal product of labor. That is our change in output for a change in workers. Okay, keeping in mind, why do we have this shape? Right here, that is our point of congestion where when we added more and more workers, there wasn't capital available for them because there wasn't capital available for them to immediately utilize. They had to queue to get access to it. As a result of that, the extra amount of output that an extra worker could contribute began to shrink. We began to get less and less extra output for an extra worker. Eventually that caught up causing the average product curve to begin to fall. And we began to witness falling average outputs as well. Such that on average, we're getting less and less output per worker. Jumping over to our cost curves then. We'll come back, we'll relate these, but let's take a look at our cost curves. I'm gonna start off with my average variable cost. So U-shaped curve there. Average variable cost, keep in mind that was total variable cost over output, 
or as we saw, that was wage times worker over output. That is, this curve was just gonna be the inverse of this one, scaled up by the wage rate. I was then gonna have my average total cost curve, starts higher, hits a minimum, and then, whoa, well, that's not how it's happening. Let's just kind of erase that little tick. I got stuck on my pad there. Hits a minimum and then begins to creep back up, but getting closer and closer to my average variable, but never touching it. And I get the average total cost. Finally, the driver of my cost curves is the marginal cost, which comes down and hits a minimum dip right there. And then from that point rises up through, I do the best we can given freehand, minimum average variable, minimum average total, and then carrying on upwards. There's our marginal cost, minimum average variable, minimum average total. Okay, so what's happening here? What's the relationship between these two? Well, let's start off here. Red line, red line. This here is our point of congestion in each. I'll label that just A, just for reference. Point A was our point of congestion. As we began to have less extra output for an extra worker, well, if we do the same thing as we did for our average variable cost here, we can keep in mind that this marginal cost was wage times the change in workers for a change in output. So again, that's just gonna be the inverse of my marginal product scaled up by the wage rate. So if I'm getting less and less extra output for an extra worker, well, my cost per producing, because hey, I hire an extra worker, plus one, this guy's increasing by less and less, scaled by a constant wage rate, my costs are going to be increasing. So once we hit that point of congestion, we have our diminishing marginal returns and thus increasing marginal costs. Okay, next point here, eventually this catches up with us and we hit our maximum of our average product curve. From this average product curve onward, right, we can call this point B. From this average product curve onward, we're having our diminishing average returns. That is, each worker becomes less and less productive on average. And similarly, that there causes a rising average variable cost. Hey, on average, worker, less output, less output, right? My workers are becoming less productive. Well, if I'm paying all my workers the same, but they're becoming less and less productive, well, my average cost per worker is going up. So I'm gonna have these rising average variable costs. So again, point B is going to correspond right there to point B. Finally, this last one here, our point of capacity. This does not relate back to our product curves. This is, as we said previously, just a point of interest. We'll just call this QC. This is quantity produced at the capacity of the firm. This is the lowest cost per unit level of production. Beyond this point, I'm really stressing my labor. I'm really pushing them hard, causing increasing costs of labor and thus increasing total costs. Sorry, increasing average total costs, increasing cost per unit as well. Big takeaways. This relationship between A and A, B and B, the fact that our product curves really drive the shape of our cost curves, all coming back to, all coming back to our big idea that we have diminishing marginal returns to labor, which fuel both of these beyond point A in each diagram diminishing marginal product of labor. Big, big idea. Now what often comes up looking at this and you're like, hey, cool, you make all these points that, hey, this here 
is our diminishing marginal product of labor starts right there. This here, again, we begin to experience diminishing marginal labor, returns to labor. But wait a minute. This is measured in workers. This is measured in output. Can we actually relate A and A and say these are the same points? We're measuring two different things. Well, okay, yeah, yeah, we are measuring two different things, but let's, let's keep in mind our production function. Quantity was a function of labor and capital, such that in the short run, capital is fixed. So in that case there, the only thing we can change is our labor. And as labor changes, output changes. So that is, you can imagine, if I were to put in this value here, whatever number that might be, if I were to put in this value of labor into my production function, I would get some value of Q here, some amount of stuff that I could produce such that it went right there. So yes, there are two different units being measured here, labor and output. But given our production function, labor is explicitly linked to output and thus our relationship. What we'll take a look at next is a few examples as to how we're going to use these diagrams and different kinds of questions you might come across. Um, big things that you really are going to want to be able to do for this course is you're going to want to be able to graph this and graph it in such a way that the relationships are upheld. So that's the big thing. I'd recommend getting a bit of practice with that. And right, big ones, average variable cost, U-shaped, average total cost starts off with a gap, gets closer. And then that marginal cost curve coming up through the minimum of each of those average. Let's take a look at some example type questions. So here we have an example kind of question as to what we can deal with for our producer theory for this chapter so far. So what we have is we have a listing of our quantity being produced. So we have some notional 10,000 units. And then we have a cost structure. So we have an average total cost of 10, variable cost of 7, fixed of 3, and marginal cost of 9. What we're then asking is a series of questions. First of all, is this information representing a firm operating in the short run, long run, or very long run? Next. Where is this firm producing with respect to capacity? Are they experiencing diminishing average returns? Are they experiencing diminishing marginal returns? Okay, it's very easy at first to get completely lost at this and just be like, well, I, I have no idea. I just have these numbers. What, what does this mean? What am I doing with this? Well, okay, let's just start off with the first question, easiest one with this. Is this information representing a firm operating in short, long, or very long run? Well, okay. What's our definition of each case? In the short run, we can choose our labor, but capital and technology are fixed. So, right, if capital is fixed, what does that mean? It means I have a fixed cost. Well, if we go back over here, I have an average total, a different average variable, which just from that, that implies that there's an average fixed, but right here, I do have an average fixed of three. So, okay, the fact that I have a fixed cost implies that, okay, I have fixed costs, I have fixed capital, I'm in the short run. If I was in the long run, I mean, so far we haven't even taken a look at anything to do with cost curves in the long run, but if I was in the long run, well, capital and labor would both be able to be chosen. So if they were both chosen, I would only have variable costs. If I were to only have variable costs, well, truthfully, I would only have total costs. So the fact that I have variable and fixed showing up here implies I'm in the short run. So, okay, we can answer that question first quite easily. We are in the short run. Next one becomes actually the next three become a little bit more difficult. Where is this firm producing with respect to capacity? Okay, until you get some experience with this, it becomes very difficult to answer just by looking at the numbers. 
My recommendation, right, you come across this in your D2L quizzes, in another situation like that, anytime you're working on a computer, have a piece of paper in front of you and work through, get out of the computer and work through things on paper, right? That's gonna be your biggest benefit, the biggest thing that will help you as you get through these kind of questions. That is, let's graph this to start off. So to graph this, let's vertical axes here, horizontal axes, and I'm gonna have my output per unit. Ah, sorry, I'm thinking about the wrong graph. I'm going to have my dollars per unit. There we go. And over on the horizontal axis, I'm going to have my output. I then want to draw my graph. Don't worry about these numbers yet. Don't worry about them at all. Let's start off with our average variable cost curve. Kind of freehand this guy going down and then coming up. Average variable cost. My average total cost curve coming down, making its way back up. There we go, U-shaped, kind of getting closer. It's really hard to do freehanding this on the computer. And then linked together with my marginal cost curve up through, well, we'll say that's the minimum, minimum, and carrying on upwards. So, okay, ideally minimum average total cost there, minimum average variable cost there. What you'll notice is that if I pick some level of output, let's just use yellow because I don't have that for anything. If I pick some level of output and draw a vertical line, right? So that would be Q, I'm just gonna go QE for Q example. Well, hey, at this point here, I have some point where it intersects my marginal cost, some point where it intersects my average variable cost, and some point where it intersects my average total cost. Such that, what do I have? I have a marginal cost, which is less than my average variable cost, and less than my average total cost. Okay, why, why is this relevant? Well, let's go take a look here. I have an average total cost of 10, an average variable cost of seven. So hey, does that work? 10, seven, so far that works. And a marginal cost of nine. Okay, that makes no sense, right? This is a number line going from zero up to infinity. It makes no sense to have nine, seven, 10. So clearly this does not work. In order to solve this question, what we need to do is we need to find some level of output, some Q of 10,000, such that the relationship between these values is maintained in the curves. Once we find this line, we can then answer these next three questions. So let's take a look at that. Let's just back up and get rid of what we drew on here and see if we can find a point where that happens. Okay, let's take a look again. So what we're looking at is we want a point where marginal cost is nine, average variable cost is seven, and average total cost is 10. You'll notice that I'm ignoring the average fixed cost, and keep in mind that's fine, because A, I don't have an average fixed cost in this diagram. B, I can always infer what this amount is as the difference between average total and average variable. 10 minus seven is three. So. I can, for all intents and purposes here, just ignore this average fixed cost bit of information. It's not needed. Okay, so where am I looking? I want 10, 9, 7. So, okay, hey, my marginal cost is in between my total and my variable. So where is that the case? Where is it a case where my marginal is bigger than my variable but smaller than my average total? Well, that's going to be true anywhere along this part here, right? Right where I'm making the marginal cost curve thicker. Anywhere along that point there, if I draw a vertical line, right? So let's do that again. Let's draw a vertical line for some value of Q. If I draw it in there, I'm going to have a value of average variable cost. I'm gonna have a value of marginal cost. 
and I'm going to have a value of average total cost such that, let's see, does this make sense? Average total cost of 10. Average, sorry, marginal cost of 9. And then finally there, average variable cost of 7. Hey, that does work, right? So given this bit of information, what I've been able to determine is that I have some quantity, where exactly on this isn't necessarily important, but I have some quantity of, right? We can say that this is 10,000, such that I'm in this thickened range of the marginal cost curve and my relationships hold between these three curves. Okay, so how do we answer these questions? Is this firm, where is this firm producing with respect to capacity? So, okay, we need to start to identify these points of reference that we had already looked at. Capacity, average returns, marginal returns. Let's go do that. So, first one, ah, let's make that a nice line. Minimum marginal cost, we said from there onwards, diminishing marginal returns. So yes, I'm experiencing diminishing marginal returns. That's the last point there. So I'm just gonna go check mark. Yes, we are experiencing diminishing marginal returns. Next point of interest, minimum average variable cost. Well, okay, minimum average variable cost is right there. And minimum average variable cost up is diminishing average returns. So again, yes, I'm experiencing diminishing average returns. My yellow line, my production line is within that diminishing average returns area. Where am I producing with respect to capacity? Well, where is capacity again? Capacity is where marginal cost equals average total cost or that minimum average total cost. So, my capacity is right there. That is my Q capacity. Where am I producing with respect to that? Well, my yellow line here, that is below capacity. That is, I would be saying that I am producing under capacity. So below capacity in that case there. So we can answer that part there. Where are we operating? Below capacity and we have our results so hopefully that helps ultimately what we're always looking at is we're going to have this listing of numbers this q of 10,000. that's just reference it doesn't actually matter what that number is that's just to give it some context what we're really looking at is the marginal cost average variable and average total and we want to draw a vertical line through our diagram such that the way that we have these numbers is upheld within Big hint to start off, take a look at the reference between marginal cost and average total cost first. If, if marginal cost is above average total cost, so let's say I had a value, marginal cost of 12. Well, where is that true? Let me use yellow to show where that's true. Marginal cost, 12, average total cost of 10. So marginal cost is bigger. Marginal cost would be bigger anywhere such that marginal cost is above the average total cost. What about, like in our case, marginal cost of nine versus average total cost of 10? Well, okay, that tells me that it must be a marginal cost in either this range that we already have it or lower so okay if marginal cost is less than average total cost i know it has to be somewhere in that big shaded red part how do i discern where well that's where our average variable cost curve comes in and what we need to do now is put this marginal cost to the average variable cost to determine am i in that initial range there or Am I in this super low range, which I'm doing blue, such that in that range there, the value of the marginal cost would be less than the average total cost. 
I'd be, whoa, that's not, that's not a C. Average total cost, there we go. Such that we would be significantly lower. So marginal cost, big driver that you wanna take a look at and the tool you would use to go forward to determine where you are. Hopefully that question helps. Uh, most of the questions you'll come across in this chapter are some derivative of this. I might have similarly said, here's all your information. What would be the value of the average variable? Or sorry, here's all your information. What is our average fixed cost, right? If I hadn't given you this bit here, you'd have to calculate average fixed cost as 10 minus seven. Could have also said a little bit different, but we could have said, what is, uh, what is the total fix cost? Well, to work out the total fix cost, let's just erase this so we can see what the average was again. Well, that there, average fix cost, average fix cost equals total fix cost over quantity. So we could go a little bit of algebraic voodoo quantity times our average fixed cost to give us our total fixed cost. So in our case here, we gave us ourselves a quantity of 10,000 times three, I'd have a total fixed cost of $30,000. And I could work it out in that way there. Again, if you have any questions working through these similar kind of questions, feel free to shoot me an email, feel free to comment on the D2L fact, and uh, we can get it sorted out.